Good morning, welcome to our services here at College Hill. We want to welcome you that are here in person as well as those that are joining with us online. It's good to be together as uh, a part of the Lord's family today on a beautiful uh, day outside. Uh, I've got several things to share with us. One is a reminder that this is Missions Month and next Lord's Day will be the time for our special contribution. And uh, as a matter of communication of which of your uh, contributions should be considered mission since we've got single baskets on either side back there. Make a notation on your check that it's for missions and we'll separate regular contribution from the missions or vice versa. And so that'll help us communicate in that regard. Uh, and that'll be more, uh, somewhat convenient for us to do. And we'll be able to portion it and identify the special from the regular contribution. Also, in lieu of truck or treat events that we typically hold because of the COVID events, we're gonna have a drive-through pumpkin party event next Lord's Day evening. Uh, so keep that in mind and pay attention to some of the opportunities we have to serve and to participate in that. Also, I wanna remind us that we have begun Wednesday evening in person and online services that are available to us and just to want to remind us of that. We have uh, <coughs> uh, some family news, some of which we're saddened by. <coughs> the Reese's report that one of their neighbors uh, had an unexpected loss in their family, the Salinas family. They request prayers for that family. Also, we're glad to announce that Ashley and Josh Cousins have welcomed the birth of Mackenzie on the 15th. Uh, so we're pleased that that has gone well. Also, <coughs> we're glad to, uh, to share with you that Josefina Hurtado responded to the gospel and was baptized last Sunday evening. And so we want to welcome her in our uh, family here at College Hill. So as we begin our worship today, let us go to our Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you today, thankful that we can gather together and worship you and to be reminded of our relationship and our responsibility to grow in the kingdom, help us to glorify you and praise your name. We bring before you the Salinas family and uh, their lo uh, unexpected loss. Pray that you would comfort that family. Pray that you'd be with Josh and Ashley as they uh, bring forth uh, Mackenzie into uh, their home and uh, uh, bring her up in the Lord's kingdom as well. Pray that you'd continue to be with Salvador and the family of Josefina as she continues to grow in the body here at College Hill. Be with us as we gather together in our worship today, both online and here in person. And we give you thanks for the opportunity. Pray in Christ's name, amen. Good morning, his day is wonderful. His name, this day is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. His name is wonderful. Jesus, my Lord. He is the mighty King, Master of everything. His Jesus, my Lord. 
Let's pray. God, you are awesome. We're in awe of your justice and the mercy that also accompanies that justice. We know that all that we have is from you. And we're so thankful that you've called us to be your children. We pray that as we worship this morning together, uh, that we would love one another, that we would lift one another up, that we would remind each other of the truth that you are king, uh, that you are over all things, uh, and that we are your servants. May we submit ourselves and our lives this week to you, uh, and may we lift you up for the remainder of our time here together. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning will come from Acts chapter, ni- Acts chapter 11, verses 19 through 24. It says, Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenist also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. And the report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad and exhorted them to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me, all his wonderful passions and purity.
Good morning. It is great to spend this moment with you this morning. To those of you worshiping with us online, uh, and for all of you who are here in this room, welcome. What you're doing today really matters. And it's not just me who welcomes you to this sermon, but it is God who has welcomed us into his presence to worship him and to know him. And I think that's just such a powerful thing, and I'm glad to be sharing in that with you today. You know, I was watching a, a TV show recently. It involved a, a mother and her daughter, and her daughter was moving out. Uh, she had gotten her first out-of-college job, and it had come kind of like a bolt of lightning out of nowhere, and suddenly she needed to be at her next venture in three days across the country, thousands of miles from her family and from her home. And so all throughout this show, uh, she is packing and she's getting ready for this next chapter in her life, and her mother is there also, doing another load of laundry, making one more run to the store. And you can see that she is quietly trying to hold it all together, but really she's just kind of shocked that all of this is happening so quickly. And so the daughter goes around and she says her goodbyes to friends and family. And then it's time for her to go. She zips up the last overstuffed suitcase, and then the moment comes, and all of the, the sudden, her, her mother is just totally overcome. She can't hold it in any longer, and she falls into not tears, but reminders and, and, and last-minute words of wisdom and, and preparations for her daughter. Like, did you think to pack this? And, and when you get there, you know you, this is the first thing you're going to want to do. And, and make sure you get a good seat on the bus. And you know I taught you to work hard, but don't work too hard. Remember to take a break every now and then. And when you go out, be sure to be safe. Take somebody with you if you're going at night. On and on and on and on, like an avalanche, just all of these words of worry and wisdom. And, and, and it was just like, all of a sudden, she's feeling the weight of the fact that parenting time is changing. Like, pencils down, and, and have, I, have I done all that I wanted to do to get my daughter ready? Like, have I said all that I needed to say for her to be ready for this next moment? And, and like an avalanche, these, these things are just... They're pouring out of her and out of her and out of her. And, and all the while, her daughter is saying, Mom, Mom. Finally, she grabs her hands and says, Listen, Mom. She looks into her eyes. And she says, You have given me everything I need to be ready. You've prepared me as much as anyone could. And as I watched that scene, I was thinking about what it must be like for parents, you know. I was thinking about my own parents, or, or maybe you parents out there might know that feeling. We tend to think of the age that a person becomes an adult as like somewhere around 18 years old, though of course everybody's different, and for some it might come a little later. Other people are thrust into adulthood even before they turn 18, but you think about a, a number like that, 18 years, that seems like a long time. It seems like a, a long time to invest and prepare and teach and help to grow. And, and that's a good thing because it takes time to grow. And yet even after all those years, here's this mother in the show with this avalanche of advice still left to give. And thinking, like, how did it get here so quickly? Did I do all that I could do to help my daughter grow? And I just think about how great it must have been to hear her say, yes, you taught me. And as prepared as a person can be, I'm as prepared as I can be because of you. As I watched that show, 
I was thinking about something else also. I was thinking about the church and its mission. I thought about this role that we have to play in God's great mission, like where God is the hero, as we've been talking about each week, and how we are the supporting cast, helping in God's work. And as I was watching that scene unfold with the mother and her daughter, I was thinking, like, isn't that what a supporting cast is meant to be? Like, isn't that what a supporting cast is part of what they're meant to be all about? Part of the church's role in God's mission is kind of parental. It's kind of wonderfully maternal. Part of our role is to prepare and to grow which is something that I think we see quite beautifully in this little passage from Acts chapter 11 and the tiny little addition at the start of Acts 13. If you'd like to get out a Bible and be turning there, that's where we're going to be spending our time today. The second half of Acts 11 and the first three verses of Acts 13. In these verses, we read about a group of believers who worship in the city of Antioch. And what we find here is a supporting cast who are invested in growth. And growth, as we know, takes time. Take Paul, for example. Have you ever really thought about How much time it takes for the Apostle Paul to become the Apostle Paul. And by that I mean like the the seasoned missionary, the, the prolific letter writer, that person whose stories we recount of how he was imprisoned for Christ and yet he still stood up and defended the cause of Christ before kings and rulers all over an empire. Like how long did it take for Paul to become Paul? that guy that we admire so much. I was thinking about that this week, and it takes a little effort to answer that question because we don't have a bunch of like exact dates and times for all the things we know about Paul. But some of the best estimates I could find based on Paul's letters and based on, on the book of Acts say that from the time that Paul was baptized to the time that he wrote his first letter that we have in the New Testament, it was something like 17 years. And that's not to his last letter. This is to the first letter that he wrote that we have in our New Testament. 17 years. Does that surprise you? Like roughly equivalent to the time when a child is born to the time when they're considered by many to be an adult adult, roughly equivalent to that is the time frame between when Paul is spiritually born in Christ and the time in which he writes that first letter we have in our New Testament. 17 years. Now, of course, Paul was preaching and and working and going before he was writing, but even then, we're talking about years here. Between the time that Paul was baptized and when he went on his first missionary journey, it's just a couple of chapters in Acts. If you look at Galatians 1 and you look at Acts 11, it's something like four years. Like the length of a college degree after his conversion to his first missionary journey. I say all of that to say that even our heroes, like even the people that we admire the most, Paul, the foremost missionary to the Gentiles, like even they need time to become who they're becoming, just like a child in a home. But also, just like a child in a home, it's not just time that gets them there. It's The people, the people who invest in their growing. 
And when the church is performing at its best, and when we're sharing in our mission, the church is invested with urgency in growing. And by that, I mean growth in every sense of the word. And that's why I want to spend some time with these folks in Antioch. Let's start first in that uh, Acts 13 part, the first three verses uh, of Acts 13, and then we'll work our way back to Acts 11. So in Acts 13, we're stepping into the story and witnessing the believers in Antioch, they're kind of having that proud parent moment. They're about to send Paul off on his first after conversion missionary journey, sending him off. This is what it says. Now, in the church in Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. There was Barnabas, there was Simeon, someone named Manan, and there was Saul. And while the church was worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And so, after they had fasted and they had prayed, they placed their hands on them, Barnabas and Saul, and they sent them off. They sent them off to go do the Lord's work. They sent them off to go to the cities of Galatia, which is like territory that's never before been reached. They, they, like parents, the church in Antioch, they, they send off Paul to go do this work that he has been called to do. And how do you think they know that he's ready? Do they know that he's ready? What would make Paul ready after all these years to do this thing that he sent off to do? How do they know he's ready? Well, of course, the first clue that he's ready is what the Holy Spirit leads them to do by calling him out and setting him apart. God is saying, It's time, he's ready. But I wonder if there's something else here also. How they know that he's ready. Because they have been invested all along in growing. The church in Antioch is a supporting cast invested in growing in every sense. And because of that, they're really important to the mission of God and really important in the life of Paul because they're invested in growing. So now let's go back to Acts 11. Here's where we get this little snapshot of who these people are and what they're all about. And listen to what we see here. Picking up in verse 19 of Acts 11, this is the church in Antioch. Those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch spreading the word only among the Jews at first. But some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch, and they began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news of the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. And the news of this reached the church in Jerusalem, so they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he arrived, he saw what the grace of God had done, and he was glad, and he encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all of their hearts. And when he arrived, he, he saw these great things. It's a repeat of that verse. Verse 24, he was a good man, Barnabas, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were turning to the Lord. Check this part out. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, who was later called Paul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. 
And during this time, some prophets came from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, whose name was Agabus, stood up uh, and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. So the disciples, each one as they were able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. This they did, sending the gift to the elders by Barnabas and by Saul. And there we have our little snapshot of the church in Antioch. What do we see here? If you had to describe this church in Antioch, what kind of words would you use? What sort of lessons can we learn from believers in Christ like these? I have a few things. Well, for one, this is a church with a global outlook, isn't it? This is a church that sees the big picture, and they care to see the church grow and thrive all around the globe in faraway places. All we have read about them is just 14 verses from Acts 11 and Acts 13, yet even in just 14 verses, we have seen them not once but twice send Paul and Barnabas to far away places. First, they sent them to Jerusalem for the famine relief in Acts 11. Then they send them to Galatia with the gospel in Acts chapter 13. So they send them first to a predominantly Jewish place. They send them next to a predominantly Gentile place. And clearly this is a group of Christians who care very deeply that the church is growing and thriving in faraway places and amongst people across the whole spectrum of people that you could try and reach. We're seeing a church invest in growth around the globe. But actually, that's really just part of it. The church in Antioch's commitment to growth, the, the growing church, it goes beyond just sending missionaries around the world. Actually, sending missionaries around the world is just an expansion of what they were already doing right around the corner. So from the founding of this church in Antioch, the Christians here, they have been just as invested in growing right there amongst their own neighborhood as they are growth around the world. It was here in Antioch that for the first time, the gospel starts spreading a little further in the new places. Some among them began to speak to Greeks also. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Like these are the kinds of things that they're trying to do right in their own backyard. And notice the similarity. So in verse 19, we're told that it's a predominantly Jewish group at the start, and they're speaking to Jews only. But now we have some others who are pushing a little step further toward a Gentile mission, trying to reach a whole new group that may not have been reached before. And all of this is happening right here in their own city. In other words, the mission for them is not just far away. And the same church who sins around the globe is also sending right around the corner. And the hand of the Lord was with them. Growth around the world. Growth around the corner. And then if we want to take it one step closer in, like closer even than one's own neighborhood, here we see a church that is invested in growth from the inside out. Growth on the inside 
in their own church that will come to affect the outside in God's great mission. So there's a fellow by the name of Barnabas there, and when he sees what's going on, what does he do? He says, I know somebody who needs to, needs to see this. And in verse 25, Barnabas goes out looking for Saul, Saul who will later become Paul, Saul who is in this growing period in his life. He has not gone on a missionary journey like we're going to see him go. He hasn't done that yet. He has not written any of his letters that we have in our New Testament. Not for another 14 years from this moment is he going to write one of those. He has not become that person that people admire as the great church planter. At this point, there may be still more than a few who are not even sure they trust him who are thinking, are we really sure we can trust the guy who just persecuted Christians? Yet Barnabas says to Paul, you need to come here. Why does he do that? I guess it's reading between the lines, but isn't it because of what's happening here? This growing that's happening here, here's a place where they care about growing. They are outwardly focused, and not just that, but they're not just growing in number, they're growing up people to play a part in God's mission. So Paul spends a whole solid year of his life there, In Antioch, how many places from this point forward can we say that about Paul? Not too many. He's often on the move. But at this important moment, he spends a whole year in Antioch. And what does he gain from that? Well, he spent that time teaching, honing his craft, developing his gift and the skills he's going to need, He spent that time working with and meeting with people, both Jewish and Greek. Do you think that might come in handy for the missionary who would later write, I have become all things to all people. To the Jew, I became like a Jew so that I might win the Jews. Like to those outside the law, I became like one outside the law so that I might win those who are outside the law. I become all things to all people so that by all means I might save some. Right here at the start, he's getting a taste of what that looks like here in Antioch. There's got to be growing happening here. So Paul spends a year growing in Antioch. And then, when the time comes for him to answer his calling, like a parent who's done all that they can to make their child ready, the church there sends him to go. Growing around the globe, Growing around the corner, growing from the inside out, which one of these is mission? Which one of those is mission? I think the lesson from Antioch is that each and every investment we can make in the growing of God's church makes a difference for the work that God is doing. And to me, that brings great joy and great purpose to everything we do. For me, that brings the mission a whole lot closer than it might sometimes seem. And maybe it does that for you, too. 
Not every one of us can go around the globe. Thankfully, like the Christians in Antioch, we can send our gift to support that work, just like they do, through people like Paul and Barnabas. Not everybody can go around the globe. But growing doesn't just happen around the globe. And mission doesn't just happen in faraway places. We can also help to grow by going around the corner keeping our eyes and hearts open for the opportunities we have right here in our own place. We can invest in growing from within. Like parents who are making ready their children for life, we have a responsibility and an opportunity to raise up people who come through our midst to be ready. To share in the work of God. God can use our efforts toward growing in truly remarkable ways. Just like he did in Antioch when he took a people that were working around the corner and helping out a guy named Saul and used them to change the world. That's God's doing. Our job is to play our small part. We can be like the parents in our story from the beginning, making the most of each day that we're given, because even though it seems like a lot, they go quickly, making the most of each day that we're given to invest in the growth of the church, people growing to know Christ, People growing to be able to serve Christ so that when the time comes, and more than that, when the Lord comes, they might say to us what that daughter said to her mother. You gave me everything I needed to be ready. And that's where I want to stop today. Maybe we can learn from this lesson. Maybe the challenge for you today is to invest in growing. We do that when we give. We do that when we keep our eyes open. We do that when we help the people who are within our reach, like even in your own family or in our church family, to be ready. Now, of course, for some here today, maybe the way you respond is by answering God's call to be ready. God has told us that he's not slow in keeping his promises, but he desires that no one should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And maybe that's how you respond today, by repenting of sins and answering the gospel so that you might be ready before the Lord. However you may be called today, we offer this moment to respond while we stand and while we sing.
This song will be in preparation for our celebration of the Lord's Supper. Mm, my Jesus, I love thee. I know thou'rt mine. For thee, all the follies of sin, I resign. My gracious Redeemer, my Savior, art thou. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, tis now. I love thee because thou hast first loved me and purchased my. Let's bow together as we pray to our Lord. Father, thank you for Jesus who came and died for our sins. Thank you for the ultimate sacrifice that was made for us. We ask you to be with us now as we take of this bread. May we do so in a manner pleasing into your sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pray with me now as we pray for the cup. <clears throat> Father, we love you and we give you the glory for, for all things. Thank you for blessing us so richly and loving us beyond our comprehension. Be with us now as we take this cup that represents the spilled blood of Christ for our sins. May we do so in a manner pleasing and worthy in your sight. Amen.
This prayer will serve as our prayer for our giving and also our prayer for our dismissal. Father, thank you for the rich blessings that you shower upon us every day. Father, thank you for challenges and opportunities. Father, help us to face these opportunities with boldness, knowing that we are your children and we're childs of the King. Father, we've also set aside what we've purposed. May we, our giving be pleasing in your sight. May our giving be with a cheerful heart and gladness in our heart. Be with us now as we depart this place. We ask your blessings and protection. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. We're dismissed.